What do the Beatles and education have in common? Well, my guest today explains that it's more than we might think. It's being on a team, whether a sports team, a team of colleagues, can be similar to being in a band. We all got to know the tune, the tempo, and of course, we have to make song choices based on our audience. And there's got to be synchrony. We all have to be aligned as we work together towards our goal of making sweet, beautiful music. And my guest today uses this metaphor in his role as a principal. And I have to say, I loved talking with him because not only was this conversation incredible and even emotional at times, I also learned some pretty cool things about the Beatles. Remember all the passion and vision you had when you first went into teaching? Feeling like building young minds and creating community through your work would make a lasting impact on this world? Well, those days may feel like they're behind you now because you're exhausted, stressed, and overwhelmed and frustrated, but I'm here to tell you it doesn't have to be like this. In fact, the love of teaching never really went away, but it absolutely needs transformation. Welcome to the Take Notes Podcast. I'm Jen Rafferty, former music teacher, mom of two, and certified emotional intelligence practitioner, and I'm here to light the way for you. In order to create a generational change for our kids, we need to shift the paradigm away from the perpetual stress and overwhelm and into a life of joy and fulfillment. This is Education 2.0, where you become the priority, shift how you live your life, and how you show up both at work and at home. So take a sip of steamy morning coffee and grab your notebook. It's time to take notes. This is Sean Gaylord, an educator, administrator, author, and podcaster who believes that all students are future world changers. Mm, Yes. An experienced school leader, Gaylord is currently principal of Appalachian State University Academy at Middle Fork. In addition to keynoting and presenting at various conferences, Sean is the author of The Pepper Effect, Tap Into the Magic of Creativity, Collaboration, and Innovation, which I am so excited to dive in and talk about. And in 2018, Sean was named the Lexington City Schools Principal of the Year. And the following year, he was also awarded the 2019 Wells Fargo Piedmont Triad Regional Principal of the Year and named a finalist for North Carolina Principal of the Year. Wow, Sean. Hello. Hello, Jen. How are you? Thank you for Uh, having me on. (laughs) I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. We met through social media, which is how a lot of us meet these days, which is so cool. Mm -hmm. Admiring your work for a while. And I was really looking forward to having this conversation today. So I'd love it if you can just tell our listeners a little bit about why you wanted to be an educator and, and how you got to where you are now. Well, thank you, Jen give me the kind of the quick two-part uh, fugue invention story of a little Bach nod there of how that happened. Oh gosh, I was maybe six or seven. And I remember asking my dad, who is is just one of the great forces of and examples of love and understanding and peace and the divine in my life. And I remember asking him once, I said, dad, what's a cool job to have? And I remember my dad uh, kind of thinking about that for a minute and saying that teaching was the job to do because you got to help a lot of people. And I later learned as I got a little bit older that my father actually had an aspiration to be a PE teacher at one point. So all roads go back to dad and mom. And then the second part of that story or that two-part fugue invention was my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. McMonagle, who opened up for me, uh, not just a world, a universe of possibilities. And she saw something in me that, that I did not see in myself and opened me up to a world of appreciation for literature and music and art, and theater, and film, and the list goes on. And then we'll fast forward maybe six years or so after that, where I was sitting in a uh, junior English three, three class with my smirky music snob self. And I thought that I was this kind of ironic, wry, smart aleck listening to Steely Dan and Ms. Rents, basically my English teacher, 
opened up a possibility with the book, The Great Gatsby. And at that moment, just like the day that I met my wife, I fell in love and knew, not with Ms. Rents, but with The Great Gatsby and knew this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to teach English. I wanted to, th- this kind of solidified the, 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 the words of wisdom from my father and then the example and belief from, from Mrs. McMonagle. So that th- those kind of early, actually that's a three-part fugue invention there. So those kind of three moments ignited for me a pursuit of what I call the noble profession. Isn't it though? It is. It really is. I ask people a lot, especially when we do work with mission and really getting down to your why. It's mm-hmm. so important to connect to your origin story, right? Yeah. You know, it, it's it's like, why did you even want to do this in the first place? Because oftentimes we get so caught in our current reality or, or we're, we're teaching and we're in the weeds and things are difficult or challenging. And yes, and sometimes I think when people initially have this conversation of we talk about remembering my why we're ignoring the problems. No, that's not what's happening. But what we're doing is we're, we're reconnecting to something that changed you earlier on in life. And sometimes when you reconnect to that, your perspective can change and there are multiple steps there. But knowing that about your story is, is so important. And like you said, entering quite a noble profession. And sometimes it just takes one teacher. It does. And and I like how you framed origin story. I'm a big fan of superheroes. I love prequels. And the older I get, the more I appreciate the prequel, the origin story, the prelude before the person becomes the hero or the icon that we all know and love. So and and along those ways, like if you think about like how Batman became Batman and, and that tragic event, you know, I always hone in on like the teachers or the mentor figures or those formative moments that help shape. You know, again, we've been talking about music, you're a musician. So, I mean, who taught Beethoven? What was it that I'm fascinated by that? Or or what was that experience that led him wanting to become that Beethoven, the iconic bust that's on, on a piano someplace, you know, or how did Wonder Woman become Wonder Woman? You know, clearly she was a kid sitting in a classroom on the island of Amazon, you know, not knowing that she was going to be this icon. So we always say start with why, but but part of that why is that origin story, those formative moments, those teachers, those mentors, those coaches, those figures or those moments that help shape who we are and what we become, which adds, I think, to that nobility of our profession and what we do for kids and communities and each other. As I'm talking to you and I'm learning more about you, I, I want to know, like, wow, what, who taught Jen? Was, was there a vocal teacher? Was there a piano teacher? Was there a piece of music that kind of lit you on fire that said, wow? Actually, I'm curious. What- <laughs> yeah, sure. We, we totally flipped the script here. You just, you just took over that podcast. I did. I love I'm it. Yeah. Yeah. I love flipping the script. There are very significant people in times in my life where I just knew I was lucky that I grew up in a home that encouraged music making and performing. So my parents were a big part of that, just allowing me to express myself. And I had a beautiful experience as a music student when I was in middle school. And really, it was a calling for me. I just knew that being a musician was something I wanted to do. And my high school teacher, Eric Williams, he was the one who taught me the importance of sharing it because it's important to obviously know yourself and your voice and your own musicianship. And by the way, if you can talk, you can sing. <laughs> right, yeah. That's how this goes, right? Understanding that, but the power and the magic of music happens in the sharing and in the mm-hmm. community and creating yes. emotion in yourself and therefore creating emotion in somebody else. That's magic. That's elevating humanity. And I, I needed to do that. And I was fortunate enough to have wonderfully supportive professors along the way. My voice teacher in college, Deborah Montgomery, and my music education mentor, Verna Brummett. They were people who believed in me and believed in my mission, which was slightly different than maybe your typical pre-service teacher in music school. I had a a larger 
mission in mind. And I got there on a slightly different path than I think a lot of other people did. And I think one of the biggest things that I share with people too, is I learned how to ask really good questions. My teachers always told me how to ask really good questions. So I might not know all the answers, but I can ask really good questions. It can lead me down some really interesting paths. So yeah, that's kind of my origin story there was, I think really the the crux of it was Eric Williams in high school and solidifying that community building, Mm -hmm. which is a big part of who I am today. Two things to that, Jen. Very grateful for Eric Williams because, again, as as we talked about earlier, that one teacher ignited something in you that led to this path that is is rippling to others in your work. And that's so important and so valuable. And then the notion of music, yes, it sounds great. It's got a good beat, that, but the sharing aspect, because I believe this, that music transcends language and transcends boundaries because it, it is a universal language. It is a universal connection that we have, transcends time and space and distance. And all of that is through the sharing aspects. I've not heard it framed that way, So thank you for that teachable moment. That's really cool. All of the things I do have an element of connection because Mm -hmm. that community aspect is most important. That's really one of the reasons why I do this podcast. This is a way for me to connect with new people like you, but also connect with a wider audience who are my listeners who are interested in some of the same things. And it's super aligned. And I talk about alignment a lot and we kind of dancing a little bit around mission. I know right before we started recording, we started getting on fire about about some of this stuff about mission, but truly having a mission and a vision is essential for getting to this next place because otherwise we're just kind of wandering around. I I, I like to describe it as kind of that plastic bag at the beginning of American beauty. (laughs) Remember? Yeah. Great scene. Yeah. You're just kind of, floating around and moving whatever, which way the wind is taking you. And you abdicate your power when that happens because you are a victim to all of your external circumstance, right? Or, or the wind, so to speak. But when you have a really clear mission and vision, like we talk about with Empowered Educator and Tenant 1 and Tenant 2, you then take back your power and are empowered to make aligned choices to move you forward and to keep moving the needle forward. So I would love to know a little bit about how you approach mission and vision and why it's become so important to you personally. And then of course, how you share that with the teachers and staff that you work with in schools. So I'll backwards design that just a little bit for you. And I really believe that the world turns through vision and, and mission. So I greatly value the work of Simon Sinek and start with why. And I know that is often referenced and sometimes it is not properly packed. We start with why. There's a lot of value in what he is saying. It's not original, but he captures that in a way that when I first heard that TED talk in my first principalship, it really resonated with me. And sometimes as principals, we often make the criticism to teachers. Don't be the sage on the stage, okay? And I used to be that guy, but I didn't really practice that either. And sometimes as principals, we are guilty of of doing that same thing. And sometimes it's important to get off that stage and help bring others on the stage with you, so to speak, or work the crowd and work the room. So I often use the story of the Beatles, a band that has ignited a whole lot with me. But if you think about their move early on as a band, they wanted to be bigger than Elvis Presley. That was their mission and that was their vision at the time. We're going to be be bigger than Elvis. We want to be this the, the, the greatest music act in the world. And they were very intentional about that. So they set out, we want to be the biggest band in Liverpool. All right, now we're going to be the biggest band in Blackpool. Now we're going to be the biggest band in, in London. Now that we've conquered England, we're going to go to Scotland. We're going to go to Wales. They were very clear about that. And as a leader, I learned early on, yes, I can have my vision and mission and and my core and and all these kind of principal buzzwords things, but it's got to be shared. It has to be collective like the Beatles. And, you know, I'd sit in the parking lot early on in my principalship and go, "Eh, nobody likes me. Nobody understands, you know, these teachers and why and why me? And, you know, I'd put on some sad Frank Sinatra and, you know, feel sorry for myself. But I realized early on that that vision and mission is something that not not only should be taught and modeled, 
but it has to be invitational because in principal school and in teacher school, we don't teach that. We don't roll that way. Do the lesson plan, do the unit plan, go, you know, we talked about earlier, pushing the student teacher in the deep end of the pool and Sometimes they're with, with some burnout cooperating teacher. Again, I'm, I'm being very judgmental and I, I don't want to be that way, but because there are a lot of programs out there that get it and prepare our teachers well. So I want to say that. And, and, no, but but that happens. And it I happens. Think it's important yeah. to talk about it in a way that's productive and problem solving about it because otherwise it just gets just shoved under the rug. And that's, I think, perpetuates some of these issues. So yeah, let's here. We're going to yeah. talk about all things. <laughs> all right, let's do it. So yeah. Thank you, Jen. So yeah. I'm very transparent about it. So I, you know, the school that I, I get to serve right now, which I'm so excited about, I'm, I'm just completely jazzed about being a part of uh, the academy. I had shared with our faculty and I was very vulnerable about it. I said, in order for me to be the best possible helper and principal for you, I need to know what the gig is, you know, as you know, back in, back in my guitar band playing days. What's the gig? What's the set list? Are we going to start off with this song? Are we going to end with this? Is, is this is this a crowd that's going to be be drunk? Is this a crowd that's going to be happy? And, and I needed to kind of understand all of those things. And it's the same way as a leader. I need to know what's the gig? Where is it that you want us to go? Where is it that you want we to be at? Where is it that we need to be? And what is the dream? What's the dream? What is it that we have to aspire to for each other and for our kids? And you can't just do that at the beginning of the bloody year, right? You just can't do that in a kumbaya icebreaker. It's got to be relentless and it has to be invitational. And you have to ask questions. I shared with the faculty yesterday, what, what are your dreams? I'm new to this school and I'm excited about it, but I want to know what your dreams are. I want to know, uh, I want to support those dreams and celebrate those dreams. And perhaps by doing that as a faculty together, then that'll ripple to the students, to our kids, and it'll ripple to our families. How cool would it be if, if you're in a contentious parent-teacher conference? And instead of saying, Jen doesn't do her homework, how about starting the conversation with, okay, hello, how are you? What's our dream? What's your dream? What's your dream today? Earlier, when you were talking about origin story, and I thought, wow, I'm, I'm really fascinated by Jen's origin story. And look what happened. You shared with me, which I'm honored by and grateful for, a very important part of your origin story. And we learned about this guy named Eric who taught you and then set off on, on this journey. For those that are listening, how cool will it be? And I hope that you guys do that, that are listening and tuning in. Next person you see today, ask them, what's your dream? What's your origin story? So I think by shifting those conversations and flipping the script and putting mission and vision as, again, not something that's stuck in a school improvement plan or on some torn and frayed poster board that, that's in the workroom and nobody looks at it because everybody's looking for the donuts. Again, it's got to be organic. It has to start, I think, with us and the principal we have the ability, because of our role, to raise that conversation up and invite each other. And because sometimes teachers aren't going to always do that and feel comfortable or feel psychologically safe doing that. And I and, and you mentioned a big part of your work is emotional intelligence. And you got to read the room, just like a musician. You know that. Like when you were you probably planning your programs, we're going to have a lot of mommies and daddies and grandmas. And so therefore. We might not do uh, Welcome to the Jungle. <laughs> actually, I actually would be kind of cool in acapella version. We've done stuff like that. I love how you just shared that example of being in that parent-teacher conference and starting it off with a dream because it creates, first of all, psychological safety mm -hmm. and then common ground. And yes. that's, that's really what Mission Vision is collectively, is about common ground. It's these agreements. And, you know, I've been, I was writing a whole bunch of things because I could take this in a whole bunch of different ways. I, I think it's really important though, to go back to something you said about being invitational, because in the work that I'm doing, and especially when we talk about trauma-informed teaching, which by the way, trauma-informed everything is just about creating safety period for everybody, because we all have trauma responses. <laughs> it's like everything that we do is a trauma response, but that's like another podcast for another day, but mm -hmm. creating an invitation and agreements versus 
expectations that allows for a comfortable, safe buy-in and opens the door for conversation versus this is what we expect from you. And we're going to get that done. I don't really care what you have to say about it. Who wants to work there? Who can teach with that constriction and that restraint? And when we have agreements that are invitations, that's a whole different ballgame. Mm-hmm. So what's been your experience with that? If that's been kind of your way. How does that work in creating that safe culture for teachers? So very similar to how I used to teach English. I would be required to teach Shakespeare. I enjoy Shakespeare quite a bit, but Shakespeare, people go, I don't understand the language, da 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 ding da 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 It's hard, you know, it's they're wearing tights. What's going on? So, and I stole this line from Al Pacino, uh, our great, our great, uh, great actor, you know, Scarface, Michael Corleone, I could go on. But, love Al but Pacino. <laughs> I love him too. Pacino, Pacino is an accomplished stage actor. He's an accomplished Shakespearean actor. He did a great documentary years ago called Looking for Richard, where he basically kind of walked the streets of New York. You should check it out. You probably, uh, some of those places will be familiar to you. And he basically just asked people, his whole his whole mission in the movie was to teach people about Shakespeare. Because, you know, I'm tired of hearing about people complaining about the language and iambic pentameter. We have to tune our ears up because the language is the same. We just have to tune our ears just a little bit. And that stayed with me in terms of approaching teaching Shakespeare. And I would tell that to students, you have to tune your ear up. It's the same thing as a principal. You have to tune your ear up to the people whom you serve. And you do that by assuming positive intent and also tuning into and assuming, correctly assuming that everyone has a gift and a strength to add to the gig. Okay. Again, very much from my band days. I mean, look at these fingers. These are rhythm guitar fingers. I am not Jimi Hendrix. I don't play like Brian May from, from Queen. And I wish that I did. I am a rhythm guitarist. I am a rhythm guitarist that wants to be a drummer. Okay. <laughs> so, and so I lock in with, with the drums. I lock in with the bass and, and I will do everything possible to support the melody. I'm great at that. And that's very similar to my principalship. I don't stand on tables. I don't do some of the, the crazy principal stunts. That doesn't work for me. It's not authentic to me. I find that I, I'm going to just be this kind of rudimentary rhythm guitarist. But you know who is a great rhythm guitarist? John Lennon. You know who appreciated rhythm guitar? Jimi Hendrix. In fact, Jimi Hendrix, and I have a quote someplace where he said, if you really want to learn how to play guitar and be a great guitarist, be a good rhythm guitarist. So you tune into people's strengths. So just this week, Jen, I had some nerves and some angst about the opening faculty meeting because it's my first time at the schoolhouse. It is, it is a tight, beautiful, supportive community, and I don't want to blow it. And so rather than me being that stage on, stage on the stage, you know, I had all these planning meetings and, and I was listening to folks on our team. I thought, wow, you've got a great idea there with the morning meeting. Could you share that and model that at our opening meeting? And I asked our instructional coach and, and, and she did it and she did a beautiful job. Then I got to thinking about, well, man, we've got a music teacher in here someplace. Wouldn't it be cool because music is the universal divine language? What if I called the, our, the music teacher who I hadn't met just yet? I had this kind of crazy idea about what if we all had like random instruments and made a sound together because our theme is one band, one sound. Could you lead and facilitate that session? And we had this like really giant drum circle and we're all collaborating. Then I thought we got a PE teacher. I know I'm going to assume knows the value of a good brain break. I ran into her and I, I said, hey, do you mind doing a brain break? So it's just leveraging other strengths and gifts to create that culture of safety. And all of that is, again, tuning your ear up, reading the room and assuming positive intent and knowing that the people around you all have a gift or a strength to share. It's very similar to music, which you said, if you could talk, you can sing. If you if you love music, you can play. Sure. Well, well, no, you're not going to start off singing like Pavarotti, but you're going to start off singing like you. And that voice is important. And how cool is it that we get to have that in the gig? Now, sometimes that's that's hard, too. It's not always easy. I got lucky with those. You know, sometimes you, it takes time. 
and you may not always see, you may have some biases or some preconceptions that you try to get out, but you really have to tune in and listen. That's the other part of music, right? And the other part of leadership. Sometimes we just have to quiet ourselves, pause. For those of you that, that aren't watching this, I'm like moving back. <laughs> and, and you sit back and you look at the whole room. You look at who's there and you see what comes out. And leaders too, we're, we're good at eavesdropping. You got to eavesdrop a little bit, right? Eavesdrop on those conversations in the faculty meeting or when you're at the copy machine. Tune in. And, and if you hear something, finding that common ground. And I love how you mentioned that, how we got to find that common ground with folks. Oh, wow. You do that too. You listen to that or you watch that show too. Or, oh, wow. I saw you the other day when I was coming into the schoolhouse. You were doing something really cool with kids. i uh, sharing that at the next PLC. Or, or I know that the perfect bandmate for you, that's going to really help you do this even to another level that we didn't dream of. Let's see what happens. Yeah, and it's really just like what you were saying before is, is reading the room and, and understanding what people want, what people need, and providing space for that common ground leads to really productive conversations, especially on this kind of meta level of district or school mission vision, because it doesn't matter if you and I disagree about the what we're doing or the how we're doing it. But if we both agree about this commonality and this fundamental principle of what we do here, then it doesn't matter at the end of the day. That's and then right. it's more about how do we help each other because right. we're all walking towards the same direction. And I think it's really important too, when we were saying, I don't remember if it was, <laughs> we were recording or it was before we were recording because yeah. we had great conversations beforehand, but we were talking about dreaming. I think you had mentioned it here. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you had said, Sometimes it's difficult for teachers to dream. And I think this is really important because I have observed this in my work as well. And I think a lot of it has to do again with that culture of expectation. Yeah. Because when we are feeling stress, anxiety, pressure, frustration, overwhelm, I'm saying we just humans, <laughs> yes. we lose our capacity to dream. We, we cannot do that anymore. Biologically, our brain is not allowing us to do that because we are in fight, flight, or freeze, and we don't need to dream when we're being chased by a bear. So we actively shut off that part of ourselves. And so when we are in a place that we're asked to dream, oftentimes I get blank brain, I don't know, or I'm confused about the question right? Or there's some sort of procrastination about doing that exercise. And it's truly because we haven't created spaces where it's safe to really talk about our dreams. And I'm wondering if you've had that experience or what has been your experience when you're talking about dreams? The thing too is when we turn off that part of our brain for dreams, I mean, that can sometimes lead down and I've had all kinds of experiences that that can lead down a path of anxiety. Mm -hmm. That can lead down a path of unwellness. That can lead down so many deep, dark rabbit holes. So the thing with dreams, again, maybe I've listened to too many Beatle records. No uh, such thing. <laughs> there's, no, <laughs> there's something about, I mean, that band, for, for all intents and purposes, shouldn't have happened. And their story for me fuels this notion, this concept of the impossible becoming possible. And everything that has been created, has been ignited into reality, started with some sort of dream. And yes, I don't think when Michelangelo woke up and when he was told by Pope Julius to paint the Sistine Chapel, and he's Michelangelo was a sculptor. He didn't want to paint the Sistine Chapel, but the Pope told him. And, and he struggled with that. And if I could travel back in time, I would love to see Michelangelo's doubt and angst when he's staring at this ceiling. And somehow he wrestled with it and he made it happen. But somewhere along the way, he had a dream. He had a vision to do that. Mrs. McMonagall, my fifth grade teacher, saw something in me that I did not see in myself and ignited that. So to answer your question, that's the first part of that dream. My mother and my father saw something in me unconditionally that I did not see in myself. As a father of three daughters, I really believe that my daughters are going to change the world. And I share this a lot in my leadership that somewhere in our building, somewhere, if you believe it, and we should believe it, is the next Jen Rafferty. 
Somewhere in our building is the next Katherine Johnson or Michelangelo. And if they're not that next person, then maybe they're going to be the mother, the grandmother, the stepmother, the aunt, the father, the teacher, the coach, the conductor of that person that's going to figure out how to get rid of COVID or is going to be that person that is going to set the stage or the foundation for bringing more harmony and peace in, in our American political process. And I call it out. Because I do believe that. I, I mean, somebody had to teach Thomas Edison. Somebody had to teach Jen Rafferty. Somebody had to teach Michelangelo how to sculpt and paint. Somebody had to teach Katherine Johnson math. Somebody had to teach or inspire Boy George how to sing. Somebody had to come up with the invention or the idea for the accordion. There we go. Nod to that. Uh, <laughs> yes. You know, so, I mean, it, it all had to start somewhere. And in some cases... It started in a school, right? You know, uh, or, or a classroom. I believe that. And how cool that we get to be on the ground floor of that dream for others. Because somebody dreamed us into reality. Somebody fought hard for us. <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's not hyperbole that we change the world. You know, teachers are world changers because we propel new generations forward. This is how, this is the gig. And so <laughs> understanding that having a clear mission as to why you get up in the morning to do the thing and the vision as to where you're going is important not just for you as an individual to move the needle forward because then you get to align all of your choices to that mission and vision right. but then the, the second part of that is when you collectively do it as a staff and and the thing is like now everyone's going back to school although you know when you might be listening to this we, you might be deep in the middle of school or, or possibly summer but we all know what that's like going back to school and it's like okay mission vision you're either reconnecting to it or if you haven't done it yet you're you're creating something new but you know there's a term that i've heard recently of like collective ascension mm -hmm. where when we do this together when we are creating a dream collectively, that's how we all rise together. Because yeah. if your vision is different than my vision, that's different than the vision of the teacher down the hall and the principal at the next building over, we're not moving anywhere ever. We can't because we're, we're literally making choices in different directions. But when we have this collective vision, we can move the needle forward and ascend, not just who we are as professionals, but our kids and like you said, our families and essentially our communities, because otherwise, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love that. You just, man, that's a, that, a collective ascension. That sounds like an album. It sounds like a chapter in your next book. Right. Uh, it sounds like, a, you know, I dig that. And as you s share that, what I envision immediately is, is I, I think about the, and, and this is a one that that's told a lot is the whole notion of moonshot thinking, right? The notion of the of in the 1960s the space race and and how NASA and we were able to put human beings on on the moon and that just wasn't Neil Armstrong waking up one day going all right I'm going on the moon that took a whole group a whole band to help make that happen just like when we make a song right but the key point that you mentioned is that part of that uh, ascension is the collectivity of that and the sharedness of that. And underneath that is that psychological safety, that belief, that support, that love, because we're humans and it, and it took some time. But Kennedy said, hey, we're going to put somebody on the moon and we're going to do it at this time. And there's that often, I don't know if it's an urban legend or not, or if it's true or not, but the story of how Kennedy, and sometimes it's told LBJ, it's, it's interchangeable how they were touring a NASA facility and Kennedy came across a janitor and he asked the janitor, Hey, what do you do here? And the janitor, instead of saying I mop floors or I clean toilets, says, I'm here to put a man on the moon. Yes, that's it. That's, <laughs> that's it. it. <laughs> that is it. That's that it. is everything. That's everything. Mm -hmm. again, you know, circling back to what I you know, was saying before about the sharing and the connection. Mm. If you're just keeping this to yourself, you're not going to get there. That's not where the magic is. Right on. The magic happens in the sharing. And, in, and the connection with people. This is so connected to my core. I, I get very even emotional talking about this because if, if we're not doing that again, then, then what are we doing and what are we teaching our kids? Here we have this beautiful opportunity to change lives, plant seeds, the fruits of which we will never see in this lifetime. Yeah. And if we are continuing to 
do things the way we've always done them just because we've always done them or continue to say the same stories over and over again about how hard it is, particularly after COVID, we're not going to get anywhere. And that is just unacceptable to me, which is what fuels me (laughs) in the work that I do because we deserve better. Our kids deserve better. Our future deserves better because what you just described right there, but that story of that janitor, whether it's true or not, it's a great story. That's how we put the man on the moon. So let's do it. Yeah. And as educators, and again, there's policies and have tos and there's accountability. And (laughs) if we put the dream and the vision and the mission in the forefront and it's invitational, man. (laughs) And, And if we believe that we can change the world and that we are part of that spark, it get, all that stuff gets lost. It does. It gets lost. It does. And usually it's about this time of the year where we have that joy and we're ready. I mean, I'm excited about back to school and, and getting school supplies and getting my school shoes. And, and then usually the honeymoon ends about September, but it doesn't have to because it, can't. We, it, it does. It can't. It can't. <laughs> it it can't. can't. Because we can't it let is, it do that. No, this is the work that makes everything else work. This is the most important work. And it's that, you know, bringing it back to what we were talking about too, about pre-service, you know, it's all about deliverables and our idea of what success looks like. And some of the stuff that we're talking about dreams, it's not quantifiable. And so it's very difficult for people to understand and place value on something. We don't place value on things that's not easy to understand. Dreams are something that's not tangible. So it can be very easy to dismiss because there's no way to quantify whether or not we've done it or not. (laughs) So we forget and that initial inspiration dies when we forget about that integration, but it's that integration that is essential to again, moving the needle forward and really realizing that big, beautiful vision that you have. So then the next year or two years or three years later, you get to create another one because your ceiling is now your floor. And now what do you get to do? I mean, the ability is is just limitless here. Teaching and the thing that you just sparked and then indulge me in this analogy. Teaching is like building a cathedral. Someone had a vision that we we're going to build this big, beautiful structure. And, you know, these cathedrals, some of them take, you know, hundreds of years to build. And the folks that had that, that initial thought or idea or vision or dream, if you will, they didn't live to see it happen. But they knew that they were doing something good and pure and beautiful for the world, for others. And sometimes we're teaching, we're building that cathedral and sometimes we're stuck in the ground floor and we're not, and we don't get to the spire or, or the rose window or whatever it may be. But that's the beauty of it is, is there's another person who has that same investment in the dream, that same investment in the gig that's going to help build and make this, this beautiful structure, this work of art for the world. And there are cathedrals that are literally standing the test of time. For the world. That's the same dream. That's the same gig for for teaching. We may not, you know, it's like Martin Luther King in his last speech, the mountaintop speech. I may not get there with y'all, but I see it and I know it's there. And I know that you are going to get there and it's going to happen for the world. So that's an important Hosanna that I think we miss in the gig. And that's why it takes that same relentlessness, that shared psychological safety, tuning into the room to help each other. Because teaching, it is also heart work as well, but we're human and we have limitations and and we've got to take care of ourselves and and fill our own buckets and find that peace and balance that's so key and value that. So I, I appreciate your take on that, Jen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, just as a side to that, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too far because this is a whole nother podcast too, but as, as far as self-care and things like that and, and overall well-being, again, if your mission is this thing over here, in order for you to reach that mission, mm-hmm. you need to be well enough to do that. Right. <laughs> you can't right. do that if you're burnt out and exhausted and sick and tired and anxious. So, you know, self-care isn't about taking the day because you have to get away. It is alignment because if you really believe in that mission and that vision 
then that means that you need to show up as your best self. So you need to make decisions that allow for that to happen. So all of this, you know, truly, and, and really all of my work too, like I shared with you before, is completely mission and vision centric. It has to be. Otherwise, I'm, again, that bag at the beginning of American Beauty, <laughs> floating in every which direction. And life's too short. I, I don't want to abdicate my power to that. I want to be empowered to make the decisions of who I want to be and how I want to show up and what I want to do in this world. And I know that every teacher who got into teaching wants to have that impact. And here's right. here's a big part of the how we get to do that is being really clear about mission vision. And part of your work and, and that key word that resonates with me and you, and you just shared it is empowerment. And it reminds me of, and I'm going to make a plug for a friend of mine and a colleague who I think Actually, she's probably would be a better guest on this than I am. <laughs> but Julie Hassan, who is professor at Appalachian State University and former principal, and she teaches and supports me, and she teaches and supports other school leaders. She's got a great book called Safe, Seen, and Stretched in the Classroom. And one of the quotes in there is that the best way, and I think she tweeted this out. I may have retweeted this this morning, actually, is that if you, the, the best way to take care of students is to take care of teachers. And part of that taking care, yes, there's donuts and breakfast and trinkets and things, but but we also need to, to feed and inspire empowerment. And that empowerment, it comes from guys like me who we do have a role, we do have a say, stage, and we have to tune into that. We really, we really want to take care of our kids. We've got to take care of our teachers. Yes, jeans days and, crisp, and surprise Krispy Kreme donuts are important and are needed and are necessary. But we also need to operate around that realm of empowerment. And you do that by tuning, reading the room, and you tune into folks' strengths and gifts, and you assume that positive intent because it's there. And People start at all. I mean, you, you hear that too. People, I mean, I used to have those dreams too as a kid, play in school and I'm going to have my classroom and hear my little Star Wars figures. They're my students, you know, <laughs> and I'm teaching them. I, I used to do that. That's key, that empowerment piece. And there's other ways, there are multiple ways to empower educators and teachers. And I, I find one of the best ways, find that gift, find that strength, find that rhythm guitar player. And even though that rhythm guitar player wants to be Hendrix, that rhythm guitar player has an important role. Call it out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny that the donut days, when I talk to people about that, school leaders who share, this is what we do for our teachers. You know, I say, that's great that donut day was Monday. So what happens on Tuesday? That's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. What happens Thursday? Yeah, what about Thursdays? What happens then? So it's this consistent thing. And again, coming back to those themes that you said about assuming positive intent, which is a huge part of everything that we do when we communicate with people and create community, but sharing that invitation to, you know, this is just what we're doing here. So I know you've alluded a lot to your book. I would love to just explicitly talk about it for a second about, obviously, you've shared some of your inspiration for it, but how do you really use that as a tool for the map, if you will, of how you do what you do. So yeah, the pepper effect, which kind of came from, that's a whole nother podcast of how that book came to be, but, but we'll, we'll talk about music and that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk again for sure. Yeah. This is oh, we're totally, yeah. I, I'm gonna, I, I gotta get you on my podcast. I, I've already, <laughs> we're, we're going to have like a part two and three, this may be a Jen and Sean crossover series like law and order, man. Love you know, it. Love it. Benson and Stabler here, you know, yes. back to back, but really the book was a bucket list kind of thing that I wanted to do. And I often, if you picked up on anything about my leadership, I love to tell stories. And uh, that's the, the literature teacher in me. And often in faculty meetings, I would reference the Beatles to try to illustrate points just like I did in, in teaching. I would always find a Beatles song when I taught English to incorporate into to something. And I found that just as the Beatles music inspired me, their story as a band inspired me. And I, I landed on, and it was around the time of the 50th anniversary of, of uh, the release of the Sgt. Pepper Lonely Hearts Club Band album. And an album that 
that is considered a masterpiece. You know, there's there's debate, debates about that, but but often it's kind of like Beethoven's Ninth Symphony masterpiece, Sgt. Pepper. It's their it's their masterpiece. And then we talk about how that's crossed over. This is my Sgt. Pepper moment or whatever, or artwork. And I thought, why in teaching do we not talk about the art of teaching and the work of teaching as a masterpiece? That we're going in there and we are creating a masterpiece just like Beethoven did for the Ninth Symphony, just like Brian Wilson did for Pet Sounds, just like Joni Mitchell did for Blue, just like Miles Davis did for Kind of Blue. So why can't teachers aspire to that? Like when we go into the building, man, we are creating a masterpiece for kids. This lesson plan is a masterpiece for kids. The collaborators that I work with are like my bandmates, like Paul McCartney and John Lennon and Ringo Starr. So the book is rooted in four riffs, if you will, that that I call the Pepper Effect. And I use the backdrop of the Beatles story of making Sergeant Pepper, and then I crosswalk it to education. And the Pepper Effect is essentially four riffs. So it's believe in your masterpiece, believe that what you're doing for kids and for the profession is at a masterpiece level. Believe in your vision, believe in your dreams, believe in your collaborators, believe that we are in this together and believe in each other's strengths and gifts. And then ignore the naysayers, ignore those folks that are so willing and ready to tell you you can't or you won't, or why are you doing this? And all of those four riffs kind of crosswalk back to the Beatles. The the famous story I tell is when they were recording the the Sgt. Pepper album and the Beatles kind of went into their studio isolation time and stopped touring and stopped making television appearances. And they really focused on, on recording that album. Well, the British press began to circulate stories that the Beatles were finished. And, and that the Beatles were over. And uh, what are they doing in the studio? How could they? And there was a lot of naysaying. And Paul McCartney tells the story of how they were reading those articles, the band. And instead of saying, oh my gosh, the British press, they're insulting us and saying that we can't, Paul McCartney said, man, we used to laugh at those articles and, and went like, wait, wait until they hear what we got cooking. You just wait. And when we finish this out, we're going to blow your mind. And um, I'm inspired by that. I still am. I get chills when I tell that story because so often we're told as educators, right, that you're not empowered. You can't do this. Or why are you teaching that? You're not making a difference. You're not making an impact. And yes, there are things in the profession our noble profession, we're under an attack. And there are things that that have diminished the nobility of what we do. Don't get me started on a livable wage for teachers, a de- more than a livable wage, right? And compensation and advancement in those things. I mean, there are a lot of external forces that are unjustifiable and just unethical and just wrong <laughs> for what we're doing for our world-changing work. So- that ignoring the naysayers is is big for me. I land on on the story of the Beatles. Same thing when they their very first failed. I write about this in the book when they um, failed their first kind of major recording audition, and they were told guitar groups are on their way out. Now they didn't take that to heart. They didn't take that personally. I mean, they probably did, and that didn't stop them from their vision of we're going to be bigger than Elvis. We're going to be the greatest band in the land. So what did they do? They changed it up. They fired their drummer, Pete Best. Sorry, Pete. Um, They hired Ringo Starr. Instead of worrying about covering other people's songs, Lennon and McCartney kind of upped their songwriting game. I mean, they changed things up and kept at it, kept gigging, kept performing, and got eventually got a recording contract thanks to George Martin and Brian Epstein, their manager. So I find that their story, um, often the inspirational part of the Beatles story to to be creative, to be innovative, to be collaborative is missing in some of the Beatles books. And I basically wrote wrote a book that I wanted to see on a bookshelf that I wanted to that I would want to read. And hopefully I'm I'm grateful that others uh, I I am a D-list author. I am not a best selling author, but I'm grateful for those folks that have given me the gift of their time to read the book and to share, to share things out. And, you know, I, uh, 
you know, when the book first came out in 2018, uh, a school in Canada adopted the book as as their school wide theme, and and they their drama club had adapted the book for stage. I was really honored by that. That Very kids cool. put did like a play version of the book. I just learned recently about a principal who um, is is doing that as as her school wide theme. So those kind of moments are very meaningful to me and make this D D list author very, very proud that, that my little scrim of a book is making a difference for others on the school level. Amazing. I'm looking forward to diving into that and having a conversation about that too, because there's so much there. And I think the big piece of that, you know, is how easy it is for all of that negativity to affect your decision-making, but especially as a teacher, that then is passed on to the kids too. So not just believing in your dream is important for you. It's important for the people who are watching you too. And just like the Beatles having their big, beautiful dreams realized everything's possible. It is so possible. It is possible. So before we go, I have one last question for you. Of course. And that is, I ask every single person, because it is important that we share our dreams out loud. Otherwise... We don't know what they are and, and neither does anybody else. So what is your dream for the future of education? I have a, a two-part dream. Um, so the first part is, and I, I write about this in the book, I, I want Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr to have a concert at my school. So that's 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 like one of my dreams. Like I'm going to walk in and Paul and Ringo are going to be there with their instruments and they're going to say, Hey, we need a rhythm guitarist. You want to play? And uh, we're going to play on the roof of the school. So that's, that's the first dream. My dream for, for education is that, Oh, wow. I have so many that every student, every child has what I had, had a Mrs. McMonagle that saw something in me that I did not see in myself. I want every child to have that. And I want every teacher to have that and to know that they can be empowered to make that impact. Mm. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> no. Hey, listen, don't ever be sorry for tears. <laughs> My people who know me well know that if I'm not crying every day, something's wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's you know, beautiful moments of joy or gratitude or whatever, it's it's beautiful and it comes from the heart. And I appreciate so much that you just shared that because of how important that is for people to hear, hear that enough. I think in this small way, even just this podcast, this is also how we help change the world. That's right, pal. And it's that connection. That's mm -hmm. the gig. It really is. And I'm so grateful that you uh, took the time to have this amazing chat with me. We are so not done. <laughs> no, no. I would love for us to continue the conversation. You have an open invitation to come on my my little podcast. Oh. And, and I'm excited to read your book. And uh, it is coming to my town August 22nd. So that's Amazing. Isn't that amazing? Uh, it's so so quick these days. So I am going to put everything in the podcast notes. So if you're listening, you can follow Sean on all of the social media handles and uh, find the link to his book right there in the podcast notes. Thank you so much again, Sean. And thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed today's podcast, don't forget to write a good review. And I will see you next time. Incredible, right? Together, we can revolutionize the face of education. It's all possible, and it's all here for you right now. Let's keep the conversation going at Empowered Educator Faculty Room on Facebook.